So this lecture will continue our robotics overview. And here I will show a slide that I've shown before and that I will show several times in this course. And recall that this course will focus on mobile robotics, history, theory, application, and control. And I like to call this slide my robotic circle of life. Right now we're in the history of robotics and the robot hardware. And then we transition to sensors, perception and representation, as well as cognition and AI. And then we move to locomotion, localization, navigation, and mapping. I am proud to say that I feel that this course is a very thorough introduction to the field of mobile robotics, such that we've had students who graduated from Rose Holman and went on to grad school and told me that the topics covered in this course are typically the first course they have to take to get ready to do graduate level research work. So it's a real thorough introduction and I'm proud to say it's because we make sure to get through this robotic circle of life. So the question is, what is a robot? Well, some things we know, and there's some debate about this, but I like to use this definition, is a robot is autonomous. It is possible to have a robot that can be remotely controlled or teleoperated completely, which means it's a fully teleoperated robot, but I like to say that a robot should have some level of autonomy, which means it can make some decisions without getting direction from the human. And a robot has embodiment. Embodiment means it has some kind of physical structure that has to operate in the world. In other words, those web bots that people sometimes talk about online that are able to work through a, the internet and buy you Ticketmaster um, tickets and things like that, I would not consider a robot. It does not have a body that operates in the physical world. Perception, it has to have some kind of way of sensing and understanding something about the world. So the sensor may be an infrared sensor and the perception may be that the sensor is telling me there's a wall there or there's an object of some sort there. A robot should also have some way of acting on the world or impacting the world. That means it has to have a gripper, a manipulator or wheels or something so that it can act upon the world. And it should have a goal or a task. How good is a robot if it doesn't have anything to do? So it should either have to follow a wall, go pick up a ball, um, fly to Mars, do something, but the robot should have some type of goal or task. So one definition for robot that we will use in this class is that an intelligent robot is a mechanical creature which can function autonomously in the world. The word robot became popular in Prague because of the first performance of Karel Kapek's play, Rossum Universal Robots. In this play, it was stated around 1921, that a robot is derived from the Czech word robota, meant to mean a menial laborer. And this is where robotics got their beginning, in industrial robots. They were chosen to do tasks that a human being did not want to do because they were either dirty, dangerous, or dull. So these are called 3Ds, or tasks that robots are ideal for. And that's because in an industrial environment, there's a lot of things that are dangerous or dull that are repetitive, or that could possibly be dirty and you don't want a human being to do them. Around 1942, Isaac Asimov wrote science fiction novels and one that he wrote was called The Runaround, which had a short story in it about iRobot. And in it, he created the three laws of robotics and to this day, these three laws are still used. The first law is that a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. The second law was a robot must obey orders given it by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. The third law is that a robot must protect its own existence as long as it does not conflict with the first or second law. Several years later, Asimov um, determined that there should actually be a zeroth law. And so he created this law that would actually be a precursor for the prior three. And the zero flaw is a robot may not harm humanity or by inaction allow humanity to come to harm. So since we're typically doing mobile robotics in this class, we probably don't really need the laws, but it's always a good thing to bring up in a mobile robotics course. So now let's talk about the various levels of robot control. The most basic level is teleoperation or remote control. Teleoperation is most ideal when you're in a hostile or unsafe environment where the human operator should probably just drive the robot. The human performs the localization and cognition and the robot provides motion control. 
In this environment, the human views the environment through the robot's eyes, and there is no need for artificial intelligence. It's suited for tasks that are unstructured and not repetitive. These tasks require dexterous manipulation and hand-eye coordination for the human because they probably have to control a computer or a joystick as well as looking at the robot's environment. So it has to have situational awareness. It does increase the human's mental workload and can cause cognitive fatigue, simulator sickness, or large time delays. Because it requires this recognition and situational awareness, the display technology cannot exceed the limitations of the communication link. In other words, bandwidth or time delays will cause a deterioration in the performance. The next several levels of control are all grouped as semi-autonomous control. In semi-autonomous control, the human may control the robot sometimes. The robot is viewed as a peer or partner in the workspace with the human. In guided control, the human provides waypoints to the robot which then ex executes those waypoints reactively. In shared or traded control, the human provides the robot with the task, but may interrupt the robot with feedback or perceptual inputs or interrupt execution if necessary. In supervisory control, the human is involved, but routine or safe tasks are handled autonomously by the robot. The next level up is teaming or collaboration. In teaming or collaboration control, humans and robots collaborate to decide on goals and sequences and what to do next in the task. And finally, the highest level would be fully autonomous control, where the human initiates the task, but after that point does not interact with the robot during execution. Some robots share space with humans, and their autonomy allows the robot to maintain a sense of position and navigate without human intervention, so you seem as if they're partners. Robot components. There are two main categories of robots. Fixed robots, which do not move with respect to certain components or their environment. An example of a fixed robot is an industrial manipulator. And mobile robots, which we will study in this course, which can travel in their environment by using various means of locomotion, such as wheeled, flying, swimming. Effectors act on the world. Examples of effectors are wheel, manipulators, arms, or grippers. Actuators. Actuators are used in order to power the effector, and examples of actuators are motors, pneumatics, or hydraulics. The brains or controller for the robot could be a computer or a microcontroller. The body of the robot is what affords its shape to do a task, and it's usually designed based upon what the robot will do. For example, if it's going to fly, it may have a different configuration than if it's going to slither on the ground. Sensors. Sensors allow the robot to see into the world and make decisions based upon, upon what it sees. Examples of sensors are IR, sonar, compass, GPS, contact, etc. And then many times there may be wireless or tethered communication links, such as Bluetooth, Zigbee, Wi-Fi, etc. What is robotics? Robotics is the study of robots interacting with the physical world. It's the study of autonomous systems' purposeful perception, interaction, and action in the physical world. Mobile robotics studies robots that move around on the ground, but also in the air or water. Manipulator robotics is concerned with robot arms. So once again, examples of a mobile robot would be the Mars rover, or an example of a manipulator robot would be something you would find in an industrial or manufacturing facility. Artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is the scientific understanding of the mechanisms underlying thought and intelligent behavior and their embodiment in machines. Artificial intelligence is the science of making a machine more intelligent by creating its own abstract model of the world. Many times how intelligent a robot appears to be is strongly dependent upon how much and how fast it can sense its environment and apply that information to tasks. AI is the mechanism for planning and reasoning. Some of the components of artificial intelligence are internal models of the world, knowledge representation, understanding natural language, learning, planning and reasoning for problem solving, inference, searching through possible solutions, hierarchical system organization, and sequential program execution. Next, let's talk about the robot control spectrum. This is a precursor to the next lecture where we go in more detail about robotics history. A paradigm 
is a standard for organizing robot intelligence. It is a philosophy or set of assumptions and or techniques which characterize an approach to a class of problems. There are three paradigms for organizing intelligent robots that we'll talk about in today's lecture. There are a few more, but this will be what we'll talk about today. And they are hierarchical, reactive or behavior-based, and hybrid, deliberative or reactive. Notice that deliberative control based upon AI was started with Shakey at Stanford in the 60s and 70s. The next major milestone in robotics was in the 80s with the creation of reactive or behavior-based control by Rodney Brooks at MIT. And the next major milestone was in the 90s when hybrid control was created. There are three basic robot primitives, and they are sense, plan, and act. And if you think about our definition of a robot, it is an autonomous creature with some level of intelligence that has a purposeful act on the world, then it's got to be able to sense something about the world to get this intelligence about the world. It has to have a plan because a robot has to have a goal or a task, and it has to have some kind of way of acting on the world. So the sense primitive takes in sensor data and outputs perception. The plan primitive takes in the perception data and outputs the game plan for the robot. The act primitive takes in the game plan and then executes that action. Robot paradigms. Hierarchical or deliberative is the oldest paradigm and it has a top-down fashion that is heavy on planning, but it is very slow. For example, the robot says, I see a door, I decide to move toward the door, and I plot a course to the door. At that point, the sensors turn off, the eyes are closed, and the robot executes the plan. The problem is that if anything in the world changes, the robot would not recognize that. This is called sense plan act. The next paradigm is the reactive one and it's based upon cognitive psychology or biology. It's an, examine look, it's an example of looking at how um, creatures handle intelligence. It throws out all the planning and it's just an input and an output. It's a direct link between the two, which means the robot would send something about the world and then it would move. It has concurrent processes or behaviors. So what the robot does here is, if it's random wander, it just moves in random wander until a sensor is triggered and then it turns. It's a stimulus and response type of paradigm similar to what an animal would do. This would later become behavior-based control. Hybrid or deliberative and reactive together creates the hybrid paradigm. This is where the plan is decomposed into task or subtask that the robot then executes via the reactive paradigm. So it's the best of both worlds. It's a plan on top of the quick sensing and acting of the reactive control. What are some of the challenges in robotics? I always take my time to really emphasize this section of the lecture because something that students sometimes have is an unrealistic expectation of what a mechanical device can do. You can write the most perfect computer programming program and if you're doing programming it may execute perfectly and then you deploy it to a robot and everything goes wrong so the student's conclusion is there is something wrong with this robot and a lot of times there's nothing wrong with the robot it's just that you're talking about a mechanical system which has error sensors which have errors in a real world environment that cannot be completely modeled so no matter what goes on in lab always remember that there are several challenges in robotics that you're not going to be able to overcome, you have to design the best possible solution despite these challenges. There are physical, mechanical, and electrical issues. Sensors are prone to errors and bad reason readings. Sensors have limited range and resolution. Sensors are subject to noise and braking. Sensor input requires processing power. Sometimes actuators drain batteries and are not small or powerful enough. Sometimes actuators are unpredictable or noisy or wear and tear or there's mechanical failure. There's also knowledge representation and retrieval challenges. How do you represent the real world in limited robot memory? How do you extract relevant information from large amounts of sensor data? How does the robot adapt to a dynamically changing and unpredictable environment? And then there's also uncertainty challenges. There's an enormous amount of uncertainty in a robot's environment. The robot's internal model of the environment is really only just an approximation. Algorithms are also approximate in order to be real time, such as your programs that you write. Robots have to act on the world using this insufficient information from sensors and inaccurate internal models. And because of all this, 
The robot cannot make decisions with complete certainty. Please keep all of these issues in mind as you execute the labs in this course.